Hi, and welcome to the Enterprise Sessions. Today, I'm talking to Dr. Neha Chandarana, who's a lecturer in bio-based and sustainable composites and the equity, diversity, and inclusion champion for the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Bristol. Neha, welcome. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. Um, so I wondered if we could start, before we get into your, your research and your collaboration with industry, would you just like to tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be working at the University of Bristol? Yeah, sure. Firstly, thanks for having me today. Um, so I joined the University of Bristol in October 2021. Um, before that, I was at the University of Manchester. Um, I basically went there to go to university and then just never left. Um, so I did my um, bachelor's degree in textile science and technology. And since a young age, I've always been really interested in science. Um, and so I yeah, studied that ended up being acquainted with composite materials and went on to do a PhD where I was looking at composite pipes and how we can use different kinds of sensors to understand what damage is happening in them. Uh, and then did a short fellowship there. And then I came to Bristol um, to take up this lectureship. I know that you've applied your expertise in composites and particularly in composites sort of monitoring and testing um, to lots of different fields. One that I think you've been working on recently is hydrogen and the burgeoning hydrogen economy with all of its promise and uncertainty. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your research in that area, how you're applying your expertise. Yeah, sure. So there's a couple of different ways that I've been sort of tackling that very big challenge, as you've put it. So using the experience and expertise that I've got in something called structural health monitoring, where you basically can integrate sensors into a structure, it doesn't have to be a composite structure, but that's where my interest is. And then you can use those sensors to um, record information about what's happening in the structure. And with hydrogen, there's a couple of different areas where I'm applying this work. And I know that it's certainly talked about that hydrogen could infiltrate a lot of different industries from sort of heating homes and workplaces, but also transport, whether it's little things like cars or, or lorries or vans or, or you know, ships that travel all around the world. Is your research particularly aimed at a, a certain application of hydrogen or is it really sitting across the industry? So at the moment, and I think it's partly due to the funding streams and the sort of organizations that I'm working with, um, it is kind of aerospace focused. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me that this is still primarily laboratory based. But for this to realise its impact, is going to have to get out into industry. So how would you anticipate that happening? How would you like that to happen? One of the things I'm looking at and working on at the moment is my first grant application. Um, and in this, uh, those are kind of the kinds of questions that I want to be able to answer. So you're right. Um, my research primarily has been focused on the lab scale. And that generally means that we're putting way more sensors that are actually needed um, because we're trying to monitor things that are very, very small scale that may not be important in an in-service environment. So I guess what I'd be looking for is some context on the bigger picture and how we can kind of see the um, pipeline where my research can deliver impact in a commercial application. So, you know, are the types of things that we're monitoring with these sensors useful for the actual application in aerospace? And if so, how, how might we go about commercializing that? I guess it's that, yeah, that taking that sort of slightly rarefied atmosphere of the lab and saying what could be translated yeah, in, exactly. in a more service environment, as you put it. So let's talk about um, the other major role that you hold at the University of Bristol, which is the Faculty of Engineering's Equity diversity and inclusion champion. I'd love to hear a bit more about what you're doing, I guess inevitably also a bit, a bit more about the issues you're trying to address with your team, but tell me about some of that work. Yeah, sure. So, um, so this was actually a new role that was created uh, just over a year ago. So the role basically encompasses equity, diversity, inclusion for everyone that's in the faculty. So that includes all of our students, all of our staff, um, you know, no matter what pathway they're on. And so one of the things that we did in this last 12 months was build our faculty equity, diversity and inclusion commitment statement, um, which is available online for everyone to see. Um, and this was our sort of piece of work where we wanted to bring together all of the feelings of what do these terms mean to members of our community and what are the types of things that we want to commit to delivering. Mm -hmm. So in particular, um, we had conversations with different members of staff at different levels and on different pathways. We also spoke to students, both at undergraduate level and also postgraduate level. And we also spoke to our postdoctoral researchers to understand, you know, what are the things that make them have a sense of belonging? What are the things that they feel we need to work on? Um, and one of the things that came out of some of those conversations was around recruitment. 
and how we can make the process of recruitment more inclusive. So we also undertook a project where we worked with colleagues also in HR and in central teams to develop some guidance for recruitment that would ensure that no matter what type of member of staff we were recruiting, um, that every stage of that process could be more inclusive or as we also included, uh, less um, to be minimally exclusive. Yeah. So rather than, you know, taking steps to include people who aren't otherwise included, we wanted to put at the core um, the ideology that instead we only take steps where we ensure that nobody is excluded or that you have minimal exclusion. I mean, that strikes me as something not only self-evidently very positive to do in the context of active engineering, but that's really something that is, is very scalable and desirable in arguably every industry. It's fascinating to hear your work in the equity, diversity and inclusion space for staff. But I think you also do some really creative things for students and their sense of belonging. Perhaps you could tell us a bit about that. Yeah, sure. So I'm really pleased to say that recently uh, we bid for and were awarded a grant from the Royal Academy of Engineering. And um, they have a programme called the Diversity Impact Programme, which was set up to support students to develop a sense of belonging in their educational journeys. And so in this project, I'm working with academics from the Faculty of Social Sciences and Law, and also the Faculty of Life Sciences, to develop an approach that enables us to understand what are the educational experiences of our students in engineering and how do they link to the things that we typically measure like outcomes. Um, in particular, we're interested in the experiences of intersectional students. So for anyone who doesn't know what that means, what we refer to when we say intersectional is when an individual uh, belongs to or identifies with more than one social identity. So for example, I'm um, uh, from a minoritized ethnic background and I'm also a woman. And so in the context in which I work, um, I would be intersectional. And so we're particularly interested in seeing how different social identities and their intersection impact on educational experiences and whether that then interplays with outcomes. I think that's so important that our people aren't just doing these things through goodwill, but are actually being recognised because it's this proper work. It's not just sort yeah. of a casual thing that you can do, is it, as a, as a student contributor? So um, is that a fairly early stage, that project? Yeah, so the project started officially at the beginning of March and it will run for 18 months. So um, yeah, we're still quite early on, but just the last two weeks we've just... Uh, recruited and uh, had start new interns that are working with us over the summer. Um, so this is, it's quite an interesting one because we've now got some undergraduate students from engineering working on parts of the project, which are quite heavily sort of social science. Um, it's also a new field for me, hence the uh, academics that I'm working with and the other faculties. Um, but it's been so impressive to hear about all of the things that they're learning already in, in only two weeks, all of the reading that they've been doing and the sort of ideas that they're coming up with. And so, yeah, I'm really excited to, to see what's gonna come of this project. Um, something that's been really nice as well is that we've got some support from external organizations in the project as well um, as part of our advisory board. So, um, you know, you asked earlier about how we might uh, link what we're doing in the EDI space to industry. Mm -hmm. And so one of the advisory board partners that we have is the Henry Royce Institute. Mm -hmm. And so that's one area where, you know, through dissemination of what we find, I hope to be able to at least soundboard, you know, some of the ideas that we're having so that we can uh, get a look on this whole pipeline. Um, so we know that improving the experiences of students at undergraduate level um, is gonna impact on what they might go on to do, but I'm also keen to see how then industry might take that up and support those individuals once they leave university and go out into the world of work. Well, I think that is crucial, isn't it? Because what we don't want to do is, is is repair the pipeline, to continue with the analogy, but then find it gets leaky, you know, not long after the students have left us. I'm going to ask you a question if you don't want to go there, say so. One of the things I sometimes grapple with in my own academic context is when you're trying to understand the experiences of students with different diversity characteristics, you mustn't group people into groups when they are very much individuals. But if you study everything at an individual level, you have N equals one for every set of characteristics. And how can you decouple that from... The, how do you how do you get something meaningful from that? And I've never quite myself 
found what I think is a satisfactory answer to how to get that balance between not lumping people into a group, which they wouldn't you know, recognize, but also not only looking at individuals. I don't know if you've got any any words of advice for me? No, uh, well, I don't have advice, um, but it's a really interesting question. And it's something that I really want to explore in this project, because I think, as you said, you know, if you create too many categories, then you end up with a very small pool of respondents per category. And that makes it very difficult to draw any sorts of patterns, conclusions, whatever you might call it. Um, and so, that means that whenever we look at data that's already been collected, it might be grouped in a way that's not particularly helpful for our cause. So intersectional data, for example, for students is very rarely available. And when it is, all of the ethnicities that are minoritized will be grouped together under one, um, which is fine for reporting, but it makes it very difficult for us to understand what we want to understand. So part of this will be generating the data in a disaggregated way so that we can understand what the patterns are. Um, and unfortunately, it might be that when we report on that data and publish it, it will be grouped together in some way because we wouldn't want any of the data to be um, identifiable. Sure. But I think the important thing here isn't about putting people into categories or saying that, you know, their experience is because they're in that category, but it's always about, you know, finding common ground, finding um, some uh, similarities, you know, just because you belong to one group doesn't mean that your experience is definitely going to be different from someone in another group. And especially in the university context, you know, we're not going to um, create initiatives for every small intersection, but where we can see patterns and we can put things in place to support intersectional individuals, we know that a wider group will benefit. So, for example, you know, if we put things in place to support students from a particular socioeconomic background who may also have one of the other diversity characteristics, the likelihood is that we'll benefit both mm -hmm. groups. Um, and so that's the type of uh, ideology that we want to go with. I think it's an ideology. I, I can't see how you could fail to get behind it. But I also would really, really encourage you as this develops and, and with your colleagues and your students to, as things become clearer, uh, also reach out to some of our existing industry partners. Because I think there are many industry bodies that grapple with all the same challenges just talked about, but they don't necessarily have that academic context in which they can really study it. So I think some of the insights you gain will have resonance way outside of the higher education sector so i think we should seek to make the most of those as best we can that's all for this enterprise session but join us again soon to hear more about the way our amazing staff and students are translating their enterprising ideas into real world impact and do please click on the links if you'd like to contact the university of bristol